So we don't have all the details about how the universe, our solar system, and its planets came to be. But one thing's for sure, Earth didn't just pop out of thin air. Scientists have recently made an intriguing discovery that suggests our planet may have formed way faster than we previously thought. You see, up until now, experts believe it took over a hundred million years for Earth to take shape. The common belief was that lucky collisions with water-rich asteroids brought water to our planet. A recent study, however, proposes a whole new perspective. According to these researchers, there's evidence that Earth formed through the rapid accumulation of tiny pebbles, each roughly the size of your fingernail. In this scenario, our awesome planet emerged in only a few million years. And here's the mind-blowing part. They suggest that water being here isn't just some happy accident, but a natural result of the formation process. Now, this discovery has implications that go beyond Earth itself. If our planet formed quickly and water was an integral part of the process, it means the chances of finding habitable planets in other solar systems are way higher than we ever imagined. If we stumble upon other planetary systems with planets orbiting sun-like stars at the right distance, there's a good chance we'll find water there too. That's some nice intergalactic real estate that we might just be able to relocate to, should we ever get in trouble here on Earth. The old-school view was that planets slowly took shape through countless collisions over millions of years. According to that theory, water on Earth would have been a random stroke of luck maybe caused by comets packed with water crashing into the planet during its later stages of formation. The new study introduces an alternative theory too. Picture this, a young sun surrounded by a disk where the planets are popping up. This disk is filled with tiny dust particles. Now here's where it gets exciting. Once a planet reaches a certain size, it acts like a cosmic vacuum cleaner, swiftly hoovering up all the dust in its path. In just a few million years, this tiny planet grows into the size of Earth. This not only shapes our incredible planet, but guarantees water's existence too. As the planet gobbles up the dust, it also snags icy particles floating around in the disk. So, if we use Earth as an example, it suggests that whenever a similar planet forms, it's bound to have water naturally. There's no way for us to travel back in time and see for ourselves so there are more theories about how planets are born. Let's dive into a different scenario called the core accretion theory. Picture a big cloud of dust twirling around in space. That's where the action begins. Over time, this cloud starts pulling in an astounding 99.8% of all the matter, eventually creating our sun right at the center of our solar system. Soon enough, solar winds join the party, bringing in lighter atoms like hydrogen and helium that are closer to the sun. But those heavier elements? The sun can't pull them in because, well, they're too heavy. So what do they do? They gather together and stick to each other, forming their own little planets. That's how Earth, Mars, Venus, and the gang got together to create round spheres. The heavyweights, like zinc and iron, sank to the middle, forming the core, while the lighter elements meshed on top, creating the crust. But wait, we can't forget about Jupiter. Its gravitational force and the suns were locked in an epic tug-of-war, perfectly balancing each other out. That's why we have that fascinating asteroid belt hanging out between Mars and Jupiter. Those poor asteroids never got the chance to become fully-fledged planets on their own. This explains why the planets in our solar system are arranged the way they are. The inner ones, known as the terrestrial planets, like Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, are closest to the Sun. They're made of denser stuff like iron, silicon, and aluminum. On the flip side, the gaseous giants, like Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, are chilling on the outer edges of the solar system. These big celestial bodies are composed of lighter materials, such as hydrogen, helium, and methane. Now, let's take a trip to the outermost layer of our solar system, where the Kuiper Belt and the Oort Cloud reside. These distant areas are home to ice bodies, space debris, and comets. While there may be plenty of them, they're relatively small and don't contribute much to the total volume of our solar system. 
The quest to understand planet formation doesn't end here. There's another mind-boggling mystery that's causing a stir among scientists – the existence of a celestial body dubbed the planet that shouldn't exist. Let's rewind a bit. Astronomers have been on a roll with exoplanet discoveries, and we've already spotted over 4,000 of them. Most of these exoplanets resemble the gas giants in our own solar system, like Jupiter and Saturn. Do you know why? It's because those massive exoplanets close to their stars are the easiest to detect. But here's the twist. A new study suggests that there's a whole bunch of Jupiter-like exoplanets just waiting to be found, and they're probably hanging out nearby. This impossible planet goes by the impossible name JG3512b, and it's remarkably similar to Jupiter, only orbiting a tiny red dwarf star. This discovery shook things up because it defied the most popular theory of planet formation. According to the prevailing ideas, it should have been impossible for such a giant planet to form around such a small star. So what's the deal with this impossible exoplanet? Well, it turns out that core accretion, the theory we discussed earlier, can't explain its existence. According to this theory, the mass of the debris disk surrounding a young star should be directly proportional to the star's mass. But here we have a star much smaller than our Sun hosting a planet that should be way too massive for it. Something doesn't add up. Either the original debris disk was insanely enormous compared to the star, or core accretion didn't play out as expected in this particular planetary system. We've established that when talking about the Earth's formation, there's still much we don't know. But hey, we've come a long way. Back in the 18th century, a philosopher named Immanuel Kant had his own intriguing theory about planets popping up in the universe. He based his ideas on Newton's law of gravity, but added his own little twist. Kant believed that the universe started with an original substance made up of super-cold, solid particles just chilling out. Then, thanks to gravity, these particles began colliding and heating up. And you know what happens when things collide, right? They get hot. According to Kant, this cosmic twirling and heating up caused some serious forces to come into play. It's like when you spin around so fast that you feel like you're about to take off. These forces led to the formation of rings of matter, like cosmic hula hoops. And as these rings cooled down, they transformed into planets and satellites. Now, not everyone was convinced by Kant's wild idea of planet formation. Critics raised their eyebrows and started questioning the whole theory. They pointed out that Kant failed to address the origin of this primordial matter. Where did it come from in the first place? Moreover, he overlooked the source of energy that propelled these particles from a state of cold stillness to a frenzied cosmic dance-off. As creative as his theory was, it soon faced dismissal in the scientific community. In short, they said, this can't happen. Nevertheless, Kant's theory was still a step forward compared to older beliefs about Earth's origin. Take the ancient Egyptians, for example. They believe that primordial spirits, often depicted with frog heads in their native artwork, were responsible for our planet's existence. Why frogs, you ask? Well, they associated the first substance in the universe with water, and frogs just love humid environments. So, out of that initial water, a primordial hill emerged, followed by the elements of air and moisture. Ribbit. So scientists have this idea that some exoplanets, which are worlds outside our solar system, might be water worlds. They orbit their distant stars, covered by global oceans. Even better, some experts claim that our Earth was once the same – a vast expanse of the ocean, and just a bit, if any, visible dry land. At the moment, water makes up 71% of Earth's surface. Our planet experiences continuous movement of water. First, water evaporates, rising from the ocean surface to the atmosphere. Then rains fill lakes, rivers, and underwater reservoirs. Eventually, all this water ends up in the ocean again. Water also plays an extremely important role in the processes happening below the ground. For instance, water content in magma determines how explosive a volcano can be. Anyway, one of the most burning questions about Earth's water is, where did it all come from? 
It's very unlikely that our planet was simply born this way. The thing is, water has a way lower condensation temperature than some other substances, like silicates or iron. These materials compose the terrestrial planets in the solar system. In the early history of our planetary system, the region where Earth formed was too hot for the oceans to condense at the same time as our planet appeared. So, there's this idea that water appeared on Earth when melted meteorites hit the surface of our planets. Well, scientists disagree. Researchers analyzed some melted meteorites that had been hanging around in space since the formation of the solar system about 4.5 billion years ago. They discovered that those space rocks had extremely low water content. Even more surprising, they were among the driest extraterrestrial materials ever found and examined. In other words, once they melted, there was essentially no water left. These results were very important, since they helped scientists rule out melted meteorites as the primary source of water on Earth. Plus, we can say that this revelation was kind of eye-opening. Imagine the unlikely conditions that aligned to make our planet habitable. Getting water and developing surface oceans on a planet so small and so close to the Sun is a great challenge. If Earth had formed just a tiny bit closer to the Sun, our planet would have been much hotter, and all the water would have most likely evaporated. If it had been farther away from our star, Earth would have turned out to be much colder, and the water would have probably frozen into ice. The team of scientists managed to analyze seven melted meteorites that had crashed into Earth. Those must have splintered from at least five space objects known as planetesimals that later collided to form the planets in our solar system. These planetesimals took part in something known as melting. They got heated up as a result of the decay of radioactive elements in the early solar system. This caused them to separate into layers with a core, mantle, and crust. Plus, the heating and melting of planetesimals apparently led to near-total water loss regardless of how much water they started with. As for meteorites, some of the samples arrive from the inner solar system where our planet is located. The conditions here are relatively warm and dry, so it's no wonder the meteorite samples didn't contain much water. But a few samples were from the colder outer reaches of the solar system. That's from where the water is believed to have come to our planet. But if this water hadn't been delivered by meteorites, what kinds of objects could have carried it all the way across our planetary system? There's one more theory, though, that hydrogen inside our planet played an important role in the formation of the oceans. At the same time, these two ideas are not mutually exclusive. Water could have been delivered to Earth by impacts from some space bodies, like asteroids from the outer edges of the asteroid belt, spanning between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. And some amount could also appear inside our planet. There's also a theory that claims that Earth gradually grew by accumulating icy planetesimals about 4.5 billion years ago. At that time, it was still only 60-90% to 90 of its current size. According to this theory, Earth managed to retain a certain amount of water in some form throughout the process of accumulating its mass, and as a result of large impact events. It sounds quite plausible. The examination of the chemical composition of lunar samples brought to Earth by the Apollo 15 and 17 missions indicated that water had already been present on our planet before the Moon was formed. So far, all these ideas remain just theories. At the moment, we don't know for sure how water appeared on Earth. What we do know is that there are many other space bodies that have water in this or that state on their surface or under it. Let's start with our dear Moon. On Earth's natural satellite, water can be found all over the surface, but it's probably not the water you imagine. You won't find pools of liquid water there. On the Moon, it's mostly ice. Some places have more water than others. For example, the poles of the Moon are regions that never get any sunlight. That's why they're extremely cold, and there's a lot of ice there. Plus, the ice in these areas is often mixed with the lunar soil and hidden deep below the surface. Then there's Jupiter's moon Europa. Astronomers consider this world to be one of the most promising places in the solar system to search for new life forms. All because this moon has a huge saltwater ocean with a depth of 40 to 100 miles, 
Yes, it is hidden under a layer of ice that is estimated to be from 10 to 20 miles thick. But it is still potentially habitable. Astronomers claim that plumes of water erupt from cracks in the ice shell and release the contents of the moon's ocean into space. Of course, the temperature, pressure, and chemistry are far different on Europa. Scientists don't know yet how the ice behaves there. That's why they can't understand how deep or large the water reservoirs on Europa are or how long they need to refreeze. Enceladus is the sixth largest moon of Saturn. It's not really large, only 314 miles across. This makes the space body small enough to fit inside Arizona. Wait, we should try that. Eh, never mind. When the Cassini space probe first arrived at Saturn, astronomers thought that Enceladus was going to be a frozen ball of ice. But then they saw plumes of icy particles and water vapor erupting from geysers on the moon's surface. It became clear that there was a massive ocean between the moon's rocky core and its icy shell. If you've been imagining Mars as an extremely dry place, you need to listen to this. Scientists think there could have been a lot of water on Mars in the past. What makes them think so? They found lots of ancient river valley networks and lake beds on the surface of the red planet. Plus, on Mars, there are minerals and rocks that can only form in liquid water. Mars might even have experienced terrible floods 3.5 billion years ago. These days, there's still some water on the red planet. It's true that Mars's atmosphere is too thin for this water to stay in its liquid form on the surface of the planet. But under the surface, it's a different matter. You can find water in Mars's polar regions, but the only place where this water is visible is at the North Polar Ice Cap. Sometimes salty water flows down crater walls and hillsides. And there are tiny quantities of water in the planet's atmosphere, but it only exists as vapor. Since we know for sure there is liquid water on Mars, could we possibly use this water during the human-operated mission to the Red Planet? If we manage to do it, spaceships coming from Earth wouldn't have to bring their own water. It would make the cargo way, way lighter, which, in turn, would decrease the cost of the mission. We would just need to take enough water to get to the Red Planet and bring along the equipment needed for filtering Martian water to make it drinkable. Well, it sounds simple enough. For more than 170 million years, they dominated our planet. From small creatures that were only a few feet long, to some of the biggest animals to have ever roamed the land. Let's admit it, the age of dinosaurs gave us some pretty scary predators, like T-Rex, Spinosaurus, the Velociraptor, Gigantosaurus, and so many others that made the rest of the animals shiver in fear. But everyone talks about dinosaurs all the time, so it seems like no other scary beasts ruled the animal kingdom besides them. But check out these reptiles. They dominated the prehistoric world for more than 120 million years, way before dinosaurs. But even before them, nature had to create the first true reptile. There was a swampy, wet era when many new groups of plants grew into great forests in tropical deltas and swamps. Trees were not like those we see today. They were mostly horsetails, club mosses, and the first seed-bearing plants called gymnosperms. It was during this time that the first peat bogs formed too. The most common creatures on land were prehistoric amphibians, which evolved from fish that were basically sick of being in the water all the time. So they decided to take a walk to see what was happening on dry land. Those early amphibians had a problem though. They depended on water to stay well hydrated and lay their eggs, so they couldn't go too far from lakes, rivers, and oceans. At least not until a special creature called Hylonymus evolved. With its four legs and scaly skin, we're looking at our best candidate for the first true reptile. These features help the animal move away from the water and explore dry land. As plants were intensely growing back then, they produced more and more oxygen, which probably helped these complex animals, such as our buddy Hylonymus here, develop. Let's rewind the story a little bit. 300 million years ago, Earth was hotter and drier, which was not that good for amphibians but was great news for small reptiles like Hylonymus. 
These reptiles were able to regulate their body temperature and lay eggs on land, so they didn't need to stay close to water. That's when they started evolving into different groups. One was called pelicosaurs, and they lived in different ways. Some ate plants, while others preferred meat. You might recognize the most famous one from their group, with a big sail on its back. People often mistake this creature for a dinosaur. Over time, some pelicosaurs evolved into the so-called mammal-like reptiles we called therapsids. Therapsids had stronger jaws and sharper teeth, and some could stand upright on their legs, unlike their ancestors that moved more like lizards. Take Gorgonopsians, one of the top predators of their time that even dinosaurs wouldn't have liked to face. In a way, they were similar to mammals because they were probably endothermic, which means their body had a constant internal temperature. They had long legs good for running and hunting. They mostly lived in southern Africa, but their fossils were spread across Europe and China too. Oh, the joys of times when continents were joined together. Top predators had no limits back then. Gorgonopsians went after different animals, especially those armored ones related to turtles. That's the type of chase I wish I had the chance to see. Some Gorgonopsians had really big skulls, almost 1.6 feet long. Scientists think some of them may have hunted in groups, but we're not sure about that. One specific Gorgonopsian was about 3.2 feet long and had a skull that looked like a wolf's face. It had long, sharp teeth in both the lower and upper jaw, similar to the saber-toothed cats. You may have heard about these from the Ice Age. Such teeth were good protection in such messy, insecure times. And we need to mention the Permian extinction. About 250 million years ago, 90% of all species, including animals in the seas and on land, as well as most of the trees, disappeared from the face of the Earth. Why did this happen? Scientists are still not sure. One theory says it may have been a massive asteroid impact, while another theory claims the spread of toxic levels of carbon dioxide in the ocean erased marine life. There's also some evidence of massive volcanic eruptions around the same time as the extinction. These eruptions could have released gases into the atmosphere, causing acid rain and making our home planet cooler. And all these things might have affected life in the ocean and reduced diversity in animal and plant kingdoms in general. Whatever the reason for the worst mass extinction in the history of our planet was, the Rapsids managed to go through all these troubles and survive. Not only that, they spread out and evolved into many different groups. Some of them even got cool features that made them more similar to mammals. Fossils show some reptiles had fur and maybe even warm-blooded metabolisms. They may have had wet black noses, like dogs, but it would be tricky to take this one for a walk. One of them might have given birth to live young, which is a characteristic of mammals rather than reptiles. Unfortunately, the rhapsids eventually went extinct and ended up being replaced by archosaurs, which were finally the ancestors of dinosaurs. But not all of them disappeared. Some survived alongside dinosaurs for millions of years. That probably wasn't an easy task. They continued to evolve and eventually became the first prehistoric mammals. But moving back to the pre-dinosaur era. Wait, what's that buzzing sound? Oh wow, the biggest insect ever! Yup, it's Meganora, a giant dragonfly that lived about 300 million years ago. Its wingspan could be more than 28 inches. They were predators and would mostly go after other insects, but I'm not sure I'd feel safe if they were flying around these days. Imagine getting back from a camping trip and instead of scary stories about terrifying beasts wandering in the woods, you only have one where an insect pushed you down and stole your stuff. And it's really weird these insects could grow so big during the period when they lived. One idea says it's due to higher oxygen levels in the air at that time. 
a lot of carbon ended up trapped in plants, so the oxygen levels were higher. Insects breathe in a different way than most animals. They have these special tubes called trachea that deliver oxygen directly to their body tissues. But this system is not very efficient for bigger insects. Oxygen moves slowly through the trachea, so the tissues in the middle of big insects wouldn't get enough oxygen to survive in today's world, where there is less oxygen. And for that, I'm very, very happy. And what about Arthropleura? a giant millipede that lived more than 300 million years ago. It was one of the biggest invertebrates ever discovered that could grow up to 8.5 feet, similar to a small car. Now that's a ride I wouldn't like to take. And once again, lots of oxygen probably gave a chance to these creatures to grow up to be the biggest of their kind. Arthropleura weighed around 110 pounds which would be similar to a big dog. And it used to roam the beaches of ancient England. Well, okay, I'm fine. I'll find a pool somewhere. And their fossils showed us where they lived. Many used to think they preferred coal swamps, but newer research tells us they mostly lived in open woodlands. They could get a lot of food there, like seeds, nuts, and of course, some other small innocent animals. These creatures existed for about 45 million years and went extinct more than 250 million years ago. No one knows for sure why they disappeared, but some scientists believe they may have been competing with reptiles that eventually replaced them. And this slowly led to the rise of our beloved dinosaurs.